We're, we're good to go, sir. All right. Uh, so we are live, Mr. Villanueva? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee hearing. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Council Members Paul Koretz uh, and Mr. Paul Krikori, and we are expecting Mr. De Leon uh, momentarily. So we'll get this started. Before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure they're on mute when not speaking. And with that, Mr. Villanueva, please call the roll. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Present. Council Member Paul Kuretz. Present. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Here. You have three members, sir. You have a quorum. Thank you, sir. We'll now hear from the public who wish to comment on items specific to today's agenda and one minute for general public comment. City Attorney will now explain the speaking rules to the members of the public who are calling and our City Clerk will then provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it is your time to speak, please state which of the agenda items you'd like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total, and one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or again stray off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we will move on to the next speaker. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you'd like to speak on. <clears throat> we know the situation is not ideal and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, if you could please read the instructions. Certainly, sir. Um, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252. Five two, five two, and use meeting ID number one six zero nine one nine four four five nine. Again, the meeting ID number is one six zero nine one nine four four five nine, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. When it is your turn to speak, an automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star six to unmute. Thank you, Mr. City Clerk. Uh, we can now begin the public comment. Uh, please bring in the first caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Yes, I'd like to speak on public comment. All right, uh, you have one minute. Please begin. Yes, I um, just want to bring some issues to you. Um, one of them is the catalytic converters that are being stolen. Um, this has actually helped our air quality immensely. We have more vehicles now, and the air quality is much better. And we need to find a way to uh, strengthen the enforcement on these people who are stealing them. Uh, the other thing is the abandoned vehicles, uh, creating uh, a lot of climate abandonment, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it. They're leaking oil. Um, for some reason, they seem to stay on the street longer uh, nowadays. Um, and the other thing is, is this kind of nihilistic uh, environment that we have right now with people writing on trees, graffiti on trees. I have never heard of that. I mean, just it's insane. I mean, all the graffiti that, that, that 
they they write everywhere on trees uh sidewalks uh, thank you sir these totally minutes go by go. these minutes go by quick but thank you for bringing up those great points uh serious concern to all of us thank you we're ready for the next caller caller please state your name and what items you would like to speak on caller Please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. I'd like to speak on all available items and after general public comment. All right, we do hear you and you have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Thank you. So I wanted to quote from the Bible about a parable of the tenants, Matthew 21, 33 through 46. It's because it's about the environment and about like fruit and vineyards and stuff. So please allow me to quote it full, fully. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He then rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, oh, by the way, you guys are the tenants. God is the builder. You're not, you're not the builder. Okay. <laughs> when the harvest time approached, he sent his servant to the, servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. He then sent other servants to them more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. You guys are the tenants. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, that was Jesus, by the way. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? The disciples said, he will bring those wretches to the wretched end. They replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants. Who will give him his share in, of the crop and harvest time? Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected? Oh, this is cool because you guys are really Masonic, right? The stone, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. Now for my public comment. One minute, please. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Aren't you guys afraid of the crowd? I quote Martin Luther King in 1963, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We the people demand a redress of the vaccine-proof ordinance. Thank you for my time. Have a great day. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Please Hi, good morning. My name, my name is Yasmin Angelidis, and I'd like to speak on uh, the first item, 21-0890. All right, uh, you have one minute. Please begin. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Yasmin Angelidis, and I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles County Electric Bus and Truck Coalition. Our coalition works to advance zero emission transportation in L.A. County because it's the right move for our planet and our air. And when mixed with strong job standards is 100% right for LA. I would like to show my support for motion 21-0890, uh, which would require the LA Department of Water and Power to create a citywide electric vehicle strategic long-term infrastructure plan. And we'd like to do this with the amendments um, that I, it's my understanding will be proposed by council member De Leon. Achieving the goals in the LA 100 plan is going to require the city of LA and LADWP to not only provide electricity to millions of Angelinos every day, but to also prioritize and accelerate electrification, including transportation electrification. And a critical piece of getting here will be for LADWP to have strong, unequivocal direction from the city of LA to prioritize transportation electrification, as well as the resources and funds to act on this commitment. 
So Thank our you. coalition supports this motion. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning. My name is Joe Sullivan. I work for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and the National Electrical Contractors Association. And I am a member of the Los Angeles Electric Bus and Truck Coalition. And I am speaking on behalf of item 210890, the Citywide Electric Vehicle Master Plan. And I want to express strong support for this. Um, I want to express support by the recommendations made that are, will be made by Council Member De Leon. And uh, specifically, um, encourage the recommendation of IDing all available funding at state and federal governments, um, regional coordination with other agencies on transportation electrification, including um, coordination with Metro and LAUSD to accelerate clean bus and maximize vehicle to grid opportunities. Um, prioritize and strategize to serve residents in multifamily um, environments and coordinate with CBOs and EJ groups on how to best serve underrepresented communities in Los Angeles. Um, we would like DWP to think more about boosting investment in transportation electrification more broadly to meet the scope of our air quality and climate challenges. We fear the plan might not be ambitious enough on transportation electrification on par with what the PUC is pushing for investor-owned utilities. And then lastly, similar to LA 100, um, we want to encourage you to make strong workforce standards part of the plan. Oh, and lastly, on item number uh, 1039, the solar and storage, we also want to encourage, or I would like to encourage, strong workforce standards, even if these are power purchase agreements owned by third parties who maintain the systems and monetize tax equity just still have the standards put in place with LA 100. So thank you very much. Thank you for your great work. Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers in the queue. It seems like we're having some technical difficulties here. So just give us a minute.
Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. My computer just shut down spontaneously in the middle of public comment. I understand public comment has now been satisfied. As soon as the great shakeout drill is over, we'll, May I have your attention? we'll resume. May I have your attention, please? Uh, please bear with us a little while longer as the drill is starts to wind down. We'll resume the committee hearing. Thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, it is the great shakeout. It's important to be prepared for an earthquake. And that. This concludes the great shakeout earthquake drill. Thank you for your participation. All right. I, I hope it is concluded. Uh, the lights are still flashing and they just stopped. All right. Thank you so much. Let's all be prepared for the next one. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so our public comment has ended. We've been joined by Mr. De Leon during the great shakeout, uh, and he's here and we're good to go. Um, so with that, colleagues, items four and five will be continued to our November committee hearing. Uh, and unless there is an objection uh, from any of you, I'd like to move items three, six, and seven on consent. And Mr. Kretz, I believe you have something to add. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, just add a short technical amendment to item six, and then it can be heard, um, which, would, which would be the, the following. Streets LA and other relevant departments and offices to the Department of Public Works and CAO report backlist. We didn't intend to leave them or anyone else off, so. Uh, that with that language added, uh, we're happy to have it included on consent. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. And I'm city attorney, um, there are no issues with that technical amendment to move the items forward on consent that we're aware of. Uh, you would need to have specifically mention that the um, item is being approved with the amendment. All right. So colleagues, items three, six, and seven on consent uh, with six. Uh, move forward with uh, said amendment, uh, and um, please call the roll, Mr. Pinoeva. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz. Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Um, items three and seven are approved on consent and six approved as amended, sir. Thank you so much. Colleagues, I'd now like to move to items 18, 19, and 20, receive and file since the appointments specific to these items have been withdrawn. Uh, so with that uh, being said, 
Mr. Uh, Villanueva, if you could please call the roll on items 18, 19, and 20 to receive and file. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell? Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz? Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon? Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian? Aye. Items 18 to 20 are received and filed, sir. Thank you. This brings us to items 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 in relation to the appointment uh, for the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commissioners uh, that we're bringing aboard. They include Jacqueline Badejo, Daniel Ferguson, Antonio Sanchez, Rudy Ortega, Tiana Shaw Wakeman, Jill Johnston, Michael Martinez, Lindsay Rose Medoff, and Dora Fritzi Amenta. Uh, and I want to thank all of these individuals for volunteering their time to serve on the city's um, among the city's most important uh, commission. These commissioners will all have a voice in shaping our response to the most pressing issue facing our world, country, and specifically our city. Uh, we're at the forefront of, of confronting climate change uh, in LA with the urgency required of uh, the LA 100 uh, initiative uh, includes drastically reducing our intake of plastics. We're taking the necessary actions uh, to ensure a more equitable green, a zero carbon future that prioritizes the communities historically faced and have to live with the brunt of climate change. It's with my sincerest gratitude uh, to all of these individuals that we welcome you to this commission. We look forward to working with you uh, and Colleagues, if you have any comments or questions before the vote about these uh, individuals who are stepping up in their volunteer capacity, uh, please uh, please take the stage. Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to uh, take uh, item number 11 uh, out of order and speak to it. I want to acknowledge that Los Angeles was built on lands unceded by the native peoples, the Tatavian, the Tongva, the Chumash, and others who are still here today. Because the first environmental injustice occurred when the Europeans landed and declared themselves the discoverers of a land populated by millions of inhabitants already, uh, I would like the first appointment to the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission a commission created with a vital mission of environmental justice to be an indigenous appointee. So I would congratulate tribal president Ortega and thank him for serving on this vitally important commission and ask that we, we take that vote separately. Thank you so much. And I concur with all of your comments. Uh, it is indeed a new day of greater awareness for our history the sacrifices made by the local indigenous communities uh, that have made it possible for all of us to be here and enjoy the uh, amenities and uh, life in Los Angeles uh, through no choice of their own. So thank you so much for paying tribute to that history and to my friend Rudy Ortega. Um, any other comments, colleagues? Uh, I, Mr. Chair, I, I have some further comments. Okay, please. Um, and I will apologize in advance for being a bit long-winded, but this is a, an opportunity that was long in coming. Um, I want to thank uh, Mayor Garcetti for bringing forward such excellent commissioners uh, and say a few words of welcome and background to them. Um, my staff and I has worked, have worked for several difficult years in partnership with the Leap LA Coalition my council colleagues, Mayor Garcetti and his staff to bring this to fruition. And, and we're so delighted to have you all here before us. Uh, as the wildfires continue to get worse, as the floods and extreme storm events and our very real mega drought here in LA and California, it becomes more apparent every single day what a fix we're in a, as a planet. 
my council colleagues and I, especially the ones right here on this committee, have been making great strides on the city's climate efforts, particularly recently by shaving 10 years off our LA 100% renewable energy goal. Soon, days, we will continue to do much, much more. And my office and Council Member O'Farrell's office have been working closely with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance and the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, as well as UCLA's Grand Challenges team and many others on a climate moonshot effort aimed to find out of the box ways to somehow get LA to carbon neutral by 2030. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we have to shoot for it. And really we have to achieve it. And all these ideas we bring forward will need to be vetted by you on this commission and hopefully uh, many more of your own will be vetted by your commission. Um, the purpose of the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission is to advise both the mayor and city council on issues relating to the climate emergency, toxic pollution, biodiversity, uh, obviously nature is vital to our survival and other related environmental justice and health concerns will also be considered, uh, including job creation and a just transition for jobs related to the fossil fuel industry um, and a citywide mobilization to address the impacts of these issues upon the communities of the city. We must ensure that the policies we put into force don't make life worse for anyone. We need to drop our greenhouse gases as fast as humanly possible, but we need to do it as humanely and as equitably as possible. Uh, in my view, nobody wins unless everybody wins. And that includes workers in the fossil fuel industry who toil in difficult and dangerous jobs to keep our lights on and our cars going. That includes the frontline communities who struggle the most under climate impacts and heat waves. That includes our youth who will have to inherit the future. We will all be co-creating together. That includes the indigenous peoples who have so long been voiceless and who have much to teach us about our earth if we listen. Each of these voices are represented on this commission. Each of your voices are essential to the effort and together working hard, we'll get through the next 10 years and make the hardest transition imaginable much brighter and, and a much more just future for all Angelinos. I thank you all for the service that you are volunteering for uh, and my staff and I look very much forward to working with you in the years ahead. Mr. Koretz, you said a lot, but it was all well said. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership on this as well. Thank you. And thank you to all of these uh, commissioners willingness to uh, step up and uh, roll up their sleeves and do this important work. Uh, so without, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Villanueva, please call the roll on, on these appointments. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Koretz. Uh, computer difficulties, but at a, a, a uh, and a very enthusiastic guy. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Items eight through sixteen passes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to item 17. Uh, Mr. Sutton Willis, will you please read the item? Yes, sir. Item number 17 is communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Nancy Sutley to the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Nancy Sutley, I see you. your name on the screen. I don't see you. Uh, if you are here, oh, there we are. Thank you, Ms. Sutley, uh, and thank you so much for your willingness to serve on this important board. Um, you are, you come with a world of experience in your professional career, and we're grateful uh, to you for that, all the work you've done. Uh, you have one of the most amazing resumes of anyone. Um, what are 
some of your views uh, and objectives as a, a commissioner um, on, on this board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the kind words, and, and thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, I am uh, very much uh, looking forward to, um, in this case, resuming my service on the Metropolitan Water District Board. I served uh, for three years, uh, from 2006 to 2009, uh, and understand sort of the role that Metropolitan Water District plays in helping not only Los Angeles, but all of Southern California, uh, provide the water that our residents uh, need and our businesses to continue to grow our economy. Um, clearly, there's no more pressing issue uh, than that of the current drought and the uh, impending, uh, or as we're already experiencing, impacts of climate change on our water supplies, uh, not only in California, but throughout the West. Uh, and uh, so taking uh, Metropolitan Water District taking immediate action to address the drought uh, to ensure that uh, not only the district itself, but all of its members are working together to uh, conserve additional water, to uh, manage the supplies that we have, to develop uh, new supplies that will be um, resilient in the fa face of climate change. These are all uh, uh, incredibly important uh, priorities. There's new leadership uh, we had at the district, some, somebody we know all know quite well, uh, which is, uh, I think, terrific. Uh, and, you know, obviously there have been a number of issues around the management of, of, the, of uh, the Metropolitan Water District that the board of directors needs to pay close attention to. And so it's my intention uh, to do that as well. Um, and then I guess lastly, I would just say is it's uh, incumbent upon the city of Los Angeles as a member of the Metropolitan Water District, a member agency of the Metropolitan Water District, not only to show our leadership in the way that we address uh, these pressing issues around water, but to play a leadership role on the board to ensure that the that all the member agencies and the district itself are doing everything we can to address uh, the, the current drought and to make sure that uh, the S Southern California can be resilient in the face of climate change. Thank you so much. Um, exquisitely said, but your professional yep. experience uh, and as a leader on the environment um, just speaks so well for, for you and this appointment. Mr. Kuritz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do want to first acknowledge uh, uh, your predecessor, John Murray, who I had the honor to serve with for, I think, around three years while I was on the Met board myself. Um, he was, you know, incredibly experienced and knowledgeable and capable and really was sort of the anchor for the delegation. And we made a lot of progress. And uh, I don't think it could have been done without him. So I, I don't expect that he would have been able to serve indefinitely. But uh, it, it's a loss to, uh, to have him depart from the delegation. And fortunately, he's being replaced by probably the best choice we could have made on the face of the planet. <laughs> so it's, it's great when you have the most qualified most capable person anywhere taking his place. So I wanted to thank Nancy for her willingness to uh, serve and to take this very demanding position. And there's nobody who could do it better. And uh, uh, you get to work with, with new leadership at Met, which uh, I'm very happy about. And uh, I, I think you'll be such an addition and accomplish so much there. I'm just looking forward to it. So thank you so much for your, your willingness to take this on, and uh, we look forward to great things ahead. Thank you, and uh, I couldn't agree more with your comments about Mr. Murray. Uh, we served together in, uh, initially, and uh, he's done a great um, service to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Daly. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to associate my comments with Mr. Koretz. Um, I've known Nancy for, for, for quite a while and uh, from her work uh, inside the White House, uh, dealing uh, uh, with climate uh, resiliency uh, with our environment. And I think the world of her, from the work at, at the federal level, at, at the state level, and now uh, at DWP, the largest municipality in the country, and how DWP goes, will we'll also be a lot of other um, munis uh, throughout the state and throughout the country. So I just want to associate myself to, to Nancy. She's been an amazing uh, leader, a strong, you know, independent woman uh, who's just uh, absolutely incredibly whip smart, you know, and can teach us so many things. So thank you for your leadership. I'm enthusiastically looking to uh, once again revalidate her strong leadership uh, as serving, you know, with uh, our DWP. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. I appreciate it. All right. With that, shall we make it uh, official? Uh, let's uh, please call the roll. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Koretz. Aye. Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Item, sub item 17 passes, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks so much, Nancy. Thank you. All right, uh, that brings us to item one. Uh, Mr. Sutton Wells, please read the item. Yes, sir. Item number one is a motion to Corian O'Farrell Price relative to the instruction of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power with the assistance of the appropriate city agency to create a strategic long term citywide electric vehicle master plan that includes provisions to maximize federal and state funding for equitable placement of electric vehicle infrastructure citywide. Thank you so much. And everyone who is in this meeting, if you could please just double check your mute button and make sure you're muted if not speaking. Thank you. Um, colleagues, the motion before us today is a critical step to addressing our climate crises. Historically, Los Angeles has had some of the worst air quality in the nation, really the worst. Uh, which is why incentivizing the use of electric vehicles across the city equitably needs to be one of our top priorities. This bold EV master plan will maximize federal and state funding to strategically place electric vehicle infrastructure across the city. We've already made great strides uh, in this endeavor, but of course there's much more work to be done and again, especially if we're to uh, reach all of the, go the goals stated in LA 100. I understand the Department of Water and Power is here with us today uh, and has a brief presentation uh, to go over. So uh, please, let's get that going. Okay. Can, can you all hear me right now? We can, Jason. Great. We can hear you just fine. Great. Okay. Let me just really quickly share my screen. Okay, and can you see the slides? Sorry, I can't hear anyone. Can you guys uh, see the slides we, as well? We see, we see okay, the slides. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So thank you council members for inviting me to speak with you regarding the City of Los Angeles EV Master Plan. Uh, my name is Jason Hills. Uh, there's a misspelling, sorry, I'm the Zoom uh, and S at the end. And uh, I'm the assistant director in the Power Engineering and Technical Services Division. I oversee our distribution and electrification section. So what I'm going to talk to you about here is an overview of topics. Um, so while there are multiple things listed here, I will be considerate of everyone's time and will be keeping it brief. Uh, first, I'll discuss our enhanced goals when it comes to EV adoption and charging infrastructure. Then I'll touch on the current electric transportation funding. I'll then share the strategies and initiatives that we're using to achieve our enhanced goals. I'll dive a little into our EV rebate programs and equity initiatives, and I'll wrap it up on how we plan to proceed with the development of the EV master plan. Okay, so as many of you know, in September of last year, 
uh, Governor Newsom issued Executive Order N7920 requiring dealers to end the sale of new fossil fuel light duty passenger vehicles by the year 2035. Additionally, this executive order calls for all drainage truck operations to be zero emission by 2035 and for medium and heavy duty fleets to be zero emission by 2045. So what does that mean when it comes to state electric vehicle and EV charger goals? Well, under Assembly Bill 2127, the California Energy Commission is tasked with assessing and reporting on a biennial basis the infrastructure needs to support the state goals. And in their latest report issued earlier this year, it was reported that California needs 1.2 million EV chargers throughout the state in order to support the seven and a half light duty EVs anticipated as a result of this executive order. Now, what does that mean for the city of Los Angeles? Well, the city of, of Los Angeles has approximately 10% of the light duty vehicles currently registered in California. So we therefore estimate that Los Angeles needs to support 10% of the state's goals with regards to charging stations, which in this case means 120,000 EV charging stations. And, and before I dive deeper into our goals, I want to just take a minute to describe the different types of charging options currently available in the market as this uh, terminology will be referenced throughout the presentation. Uh, beginning with the level one charging, most car manufacturers provide one of these chargers when you purchase a plug-in electric car. You can typically plug these into a regular 120 volt house outlets. And it's good for vehicles with short range batteries, such as a plug-in hybrid. Um, it'll provide you with around three to five miles of range per hour and takes approximately 20 hours or more actually to fully charge an EV, depending on range. Um, these chargers don't help to address one of the major concerns of range anxiety, and that's why our programs typically focus on providing equitable access to higher level chargers, such as a level two charger. And a level two charger can be installed in single family residences, or workplaces, multi-family units, um, and multifamily units that have actually been the majority of the charger installations that have been incentivized through our rebate program. Um, these could provide an 80% charge within, say, eight hours, or you can fully charge your vehicle while you're sleeping at night. And the last option here is DC fast charging, which uh, provides an experience more similar to a gas station experience. Uh, for even longer range EVs, you can also get an 80% charge in, in maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, you'll typically find these installations in public areas, such as shopping plazas, retail spaces, and some well-known installers of these types of chargers include uh, Tesla, Electrify America, and EVgo. Okay, now the slide you see here uh, shows you our, our previous goals, which were largely driven by the prior executive order issued by Governor Brown back in 2018. Um, you can see by the actual installations, the shaded portion, um, we've made great strides and we're in fact starting to overshoot uh, the trajectory of our 2025 goal, which was 25,000 charging stations. Um, over the past three years, we've essentially increased our charging station count in the city by, by 11 fold, uh, largely due to our um, enhanced program and our rebate programs, um, going from 1,250 commercial charging stations to uh, 14, almost 14,000 now. However, uh, when we realign our goals, to the more recent State Assembly Bill 2127 assessment, we can see there's way much more work to be done to facilitate the accelera uh, acceleration um, of electric vehicle adoption um, and the deployment of EV charging infrastructure in LA. Now this slide provides more detailed vis visualization of uh, where we're at and what lies ahead of us in order to align ourselves to meet state goals. On top of uh, on the top, you can see we currently have 73,000 uh, 73, EVs in the city. Um, Assembly Bill 2127 suggests that we should anticipate needing to ramp up to support 750,000 light duty and 12,000 medium heavy duty vehicles by 2030. Uh, the infrastructure graphics you see below um, show uh, where we currently stand in gray. With regard to level two charging stations and DC fast chargers, uh, these together add up to the almost 14,000 chargers currently installed in the city. Uh, the green numbers for here 
Um, those show what we know are currently in the queue based on rebate application data we have received. Um, this leaves us with the gap that you see on the right, some pretty large numbers. Um, you can see 20, almost 26,000 level two charging stations more that we need to um, find a way to get installed in the city by, by 2025. And then in order to reach the 2030 goal, we actually need to install over 100,000 um, more chargers than we currently have installed or in the queue. And um, it's also very important to uh, not forget about the DC fast charging uh, stations. And um, about 60% of our customer base lives in multi-knit dwellings, um, which are heavily dependent on these types of uh, charging stations. So we also have a, quite a bit of work to do um, in regard to those um, more larger scale installations. Okay, so, so now I'll br briefly touch on our program funding. In 2016, LADWP voluntarily opted into the California Air Resources Board Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program uh, to generate base credits for uh, EV charging station installations. Uh, to date, we received um, low carbon fuel standard proceeds from credit sales of approximately $100 million. And uh, pursuant to this regulation, um, electric distribution utilities such as ourselves um, must use all these credit proceeds to benefit current or future EV customers, uh, to educate the public on the benefits of electric transportation, um, or to provide rate options that encourage off-peak charging and minimize adverse impacts to the electrical grid. Um, this is a key program that helps to increase EV adoption and the deployment of charging infrastructure while reducing the carbon intensity of transportation fuel. And uh, so how are these credits generated? Well, uh, electric, dis uh, electric utilities such as LADWP receive base credits uh, for reducing the carbon intensity of transportation fuels. Um, and the fuel in this case is electricity. And the Air Resources Board calculates how many credits we receive based on EV registrations in our territory, along with some meter data that we have um, from our, our customers. Uh, we also receive additional credits for metered installations that we completed ourselves or, all, or that we may have incentivized through um, like MOUs with other city agencies. Uh, something to note on the right here is that um, starting 2022, so just a few months from now, 30% uh, of base credit proceeds will need to be allocated to benefit disadvantaged communities and, and low income uh, customers. So we currently are already um, using over 30% of our proceeds to support these efforts. Um, and we do plan to further increase them. And as you can see below, starting, um, you know, just a few more years later, starting 2024, 50% of credits um, will need to be uh, allocated to support efforts in disadvantaged communities uh, and for low income customers. Okay. so. Um, with regards to strategies and initiatives to achieve our revised targets, uh, we're, we're taking a multi-pronged approach, um, one of them being LADWP installed charging stations, both level two and DC fast chargers. Um, uh, the point of this slide is just to show that there is a heavy focus on disadvantaged communities for our own installations, which is in the uh, blue area um, across the board, uh, level two charging stations, DC fast charging stations, and also the ones that we have in the queue. Um, so that, that is one of the strategies we're taking to, um, to help us uh, achieve our goals. And, um, and in order to further expand on public charging network over the next nine years to 2030, we, we plan to take on many actions such as targeting at least 40% of public charging stations in disadvantaged communities. Uh, we've also been working to develop uh, attractive cost-based electric rates to help keep the cost of operating an EV below that of gasoline. Uh, we plan to continue uh, designing programs to encourage installation in disadvantaged communities, um, such as our rebate program. Um, as mentioned, our direct installations will be heavily focused in disadvantaged communities, and we plan to continue to collaborate on a city-wide initiative to improve streamlining of charging station installations and, and permitting processes. Um, we're excited to be working with a wide range of stakeholders in these efforts, such as charging station operators and installers, the mayor's office, our sister agencies, city councils, and its uh, committee. But with regard to uh, sister agencies, uh, we 
certainly couldn't have succeeded in reaching our goals up until now without the collaboration of, of them. Um, to assist the other agencies, we've been using state program funding to enter into memorandums of understanding with them to help expand on the charging infrastructure in the city. Uh, we've previously wrapped up an MOU with the General Service Division and supported over 100 charging stations at City Hall. But we've recently executed a new MOU to support over 30 projects across the city with them. Uh, we also recently just executed an MOU with LADOT to support in their bus electrification. And we also have an MOU with the Port of LA to help electrify port handling equipment and, and the goods movement efforts. Um, we've been working with the Bureau of Street Lighting, who has been an innovation leader in the industry. Um, we often get inquiries from research institutions and other utilities who want to learn from the success of um, the Bureau of Street Lighting. Uh, we've already teamed up to support the installation of over 400 EV chargers, and we're working on an MOU to continue and expand on this. We've also been working um, with LADOT on their Blue LA car sharing program, which has been primarily focused on providing accessible, clean transportation options to disadvantaged communities. Uh, we're working on an MOU to support the next phase of the program. And uh, lastly, we're working with um, the Bureau of Sanitation to support their effort to electrify some of their waste management vehicles. Now, one of the biggest strategies we've utilized to incentivize the installation of EV chargers in the city has been our rebate programs. Uh, we plan to continue offering uh, rebates with uh, continuously enhanced um, additions uh, based on the needs of the city. Uh, with regard to our residential programs, we currently offer a $1,500 rebate for the purchase of a used EV to make them more accessible to our, our residents. Uh, we plan to further enhance this by offering an additional $1,500 for customers enrolled in our low income programs. Uh, for the chargers necessary to support these residential customers, we offer a $500 rebate to cover the purchase price of a charger. Our plan is to provide additional incentives to, for installation costs and uh, additional for uh, low income customers. Um, these enhancements align with a low carbon fuel standard regulation, which I mentioned um, requires um, higher percentage of the expenditure be allocated to low income and disadvantaged communities. So here are the commercial rebate programs that we're currently offering. These programs have supported approximately 90% of the nearly 14,000 chargers installed in the city to date. Uh, we have three active programs. Uh, the level two charger program um, serves our commercial customers and say multi-unit dwellings, workplaces, uh, public destinations, um, and they can get $4,000 per charger. And if the location is in a disadvantaged community as defined by Cal Virus screen, um, customers can get uh, $5,000 per charger. Uh, to incentivize DC fast chargers, we offer a DC fast charger rebate, which provides up to $75,000 per charger. And this was launched about two years ago. Uh, our most recently launched program is the medium heavy duty rebate, which aims to electrify one of the highest polluting sectors. This program offers up to $125,000 per charger. And uh, one of our first recipients of this rebate happens to be the LA Metro, who applied for this rebate to support the electrification of the Orange Line. Um, and, and this slide, uh, the point of this slide is just to show that over the past two, two years, we, we have been able to offer over $80 million in EV and EV charger rebates, um, largely thanks to um, the state funded programs. Um, and uh, this is my last slide, uh, just to discuss how we plan to proceed with the EV master plan development. Um, we do plan to continuously work to identify and um, to reach out to stakeholders to gather input. Uh, we'll be working together to develop the city plan, um, the values, the goals, framework, and strategy. Um, in addition to determining funding needs and opportunities, such as those through available uh, that are available through um, state and federal government, um, we'll develop a draft master plan, um, obtain feedback through public workshops, and we'll continue to revise and improve on the plan um, with the feedback obtained. And um, you know, this uh, electric transportation effort is evolving. The technology is changing. The needs are changing. So um, you know, we anticipate that this is something that's going to have to um, continuously be uh, looked at and revised as we go. And with that, uh, that, that concludes uh, this presentation.
Thank you so much, Mr. Hill. So thanks for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, a lot went into this, uh, very illuminating, and we appreciate it. Uh, with that, I have some questions, and then, of course, we'll open it up to, uh, to my colleagues here. Uh, can you specify uh, as closely as possible how many EV chargers are already built and functioning within the city of Los Angeles? Yeah, yes, it's um, actually it's uh, just under 14,000. And I'm only talking about to what we define as uh, commercial chargers, um, ones that are uh, installed like in places where our where they are uh, commercial customers uh, of ours. So it can be multi-unit dwellings, public uh, retail places, uh, workplaces. So we are aware of um, just under 14,000. Right. And of course, this doesn't account for people who have bought Teslas and they have a, some sort of advanced charging capability in their own garage or whatever, which is probably we in LA, have, it's probably in the multi-thousands, tens of thousands even. Yeah. I mean, as far as the amount of uh, residential charger rebates we've issued, um, we have issued over 3,000 of those. But that, of course, that's only a small fraction of how many people actually have chargers at their homes. Do you think those have mostly been apartment buildings? Oh, the residential ones are mostly been single family. Okay, the ones that you have been part of. Yeah. Now, our commercial programs, however, uh, the the uh, rebate, the fourteen thousand, um, almost fourteen thousand commercial chargers. Uh, actually, a large fraction of those have been installed in multi-unit dwellings. Okay. Um, I, I would say the majority of them have been. Thank based you. Based on our rebate data. Does the department currently have a a, a map that's publicly available to show? where the uh, accessible EV charges are within the city? Uh, you, you know, we we don't have one published because typically EV drivers r rely on maps through um, sources such as PlugShare. But um, we do have that data because we do have a partnership with PlugShare um, in order to obtain this data. Um, so, I, you know, that is that is something we could do, but uh, most drivers would rely on, on these other um, crowdsource uh, mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then can you elaborate a little on the federal and state funding uh, in relation to the city in terms of building uh, out the, the master plan and infrastructure thus far and, and into the future? So, re so really what we, um, what we need to do actually is uh, we, we need to work with the other city agencies and basically determine um, projects that are candidates. For, for the types of funding opportunities that come available. So, so really, we, we really just have to keep an eye out to see what comes up and, and then be prepared to uh, make proposals to support um, in any types of uh, projects when opportunities uh, come about. So, um, you know, we're, we're keeping an eye out on that. We're working with our other city agencies. Um, I, I know some of the other agencies have been working on, like DOT has, has been, um, seeking uh, one grant called like step grant and then we are supporting them um in applying for for these grants um blue la actually was an example of um one where um dot also applied for a grant to which we partner partnering with them on so it's something that we just continuously have to scan both on the federal and state level and have a, a queue of potential projects that we could propose Right. I mean, this is a bad pun, but you're you're very pug plugged in uh, to the state uh, and federal funding. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Mr. Krikorian and myself uh, recently uh, had a, an initiative approved by the full city council on the equitable hiring plan, uh, ensuring that environmentally and economically disadvantaged communities um, are not left behind. Uh, in the expectation of creating at minimal 9,500 new jobs in, in relation to our LA 100 goals. Uh, does, does this department uh, have a similar strategy in relation to the rollout of our EV master plan? So with regards to the EV program, we, we have not... Um, we have not baked that component in. However, there are some things that we're looking at um, in support of this, such as, um, uh, like, for example, there are some training programs that are being uh, 
developed and starting to become adopted in the industry uh, that could help uh, people be certified for specifically EV charger installation. So, so those are things we're looking into to see which ones emerge to be um, the well qualified and sort of uh, good certifications that we could then um, use to sponsor programs and um, you know assist in, in in workforce development efforts related to electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And then, uh, in terms of incentive uh, or, rebate, or rebate programs, um, can you expand a little bit on the um, inclusion of multifamily residences uh, uh, who have historically uh, lived with the consequences uh, of, of climate change? Um, and do you have uh, those rebate or in, uh, incentive programs in place? So, um, so the rebate program we have in place that, that supports um, like multi-unit residents, uh, customers in um, say, you know, like environment, Enviro Screen may uh, determine that disadvantaged community based partially on, on uh, pollution, for example. Well, um, we did establish a, um, enhancement to our commercial charger rebate program, which gives an additional thousand dollars for installations in disadvantaged communities. So that is that is one way we've um, been trying to address this is by providing additional incentive, um, which typically goes to multi-unit dwelling um, customers, but it's not specifically targeted to that. There are other commercial customers who may not be uh, like the multi-unit a facility that would still qualify. So, I mean, this is stuff that we could still, uh, you know, obtain feedback and, and see if there's a way that we could uh, further hone in and, and refine our programs to further enhance them and, and target uh, more specifically those uh, customers faced with, with that situation. Great. Yeah, we can explore other options uh, to cover the whole spectrum of of what a disadvantaged community looks like because there are certainly disadvantaged commercial districts and everything else. So something to further explore. And then um, what, what community sustainability and environmental organizations uh, is the department planning to engage with? Uh, you mentioned a few, but in, in terms of uh, creating our EV master plan uh, to make sure that there's just broad outreach on, uh, so that uh, uh, input uh, is included uh, with within that broad outreach. Um, you know, I I do have. Um, I would like to call on one of my managers who is attending this meeting, who has been heavily involved with our outreach uh, team more recently. His name is Yamanani. Um, if, if you don't mind, I would like to ask him to um, to join us here. And actually, if he could. Uh, Name the uh, groups uh, that um, we are planning to to engage in as we embark on this master plan. I, Yaman, are you there? Perhaps they're not there, or they're on mute. Okay, so, um, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Oh, uh, okay, uh, there we go. Yes. Good morning, uh, Council Committee. This is Yaman Nani. I'm, uh, former electric transportation program supervisor uh, under Jason Hills. And uh, so, yes, uh, we, we have been working with our sustainability division uh, recently on a community partnership grant uh, that was actually awarded by our board uh, for nine uh, community organizations. Uh, and this is going to be uh, awarding actual project installation, in, particularly in, in disadvantaged and underserved communities. And um, these organizations, there's actually a list of nine that have been awarded. And some of the, the awards will include community outreach and input uh, from, from those communities as to their needs with regards to EV charging, but also other uh, distributed energy resources such as solar. Um, so these include Climate Resolve, uh, the LA uh, County Bicycle Coalition, uh, Toberman Neighborhood Center, uh, One Generation US Green Building Council of LA, LA Community College District, Discovery Cube, and Pacoima Beautiful, as well as the Internal uh, Services Department with the LA County. Uh, 
So I think we're, 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 our plan is to leverage uh, this relationship that we already have. But of course, um, there's any recommendation to engage other community-based organizations as part of this master planning effort, we're, we're more than happy to do so. Terrific, thank you. And of course, this dialogue will be ongoing. We're not finalizing anything in stone here, but uh, the work so far has been uh, very robust. So we thank you for that. And then lastly, before I open it up, what conversations has the department been have, having uh, regarding the transitioning the city's entire vehicle fleet uh, to EVs? So that's actually something that um, that we that's actually one of the biggest things that um, we are looking forward to with regard to this master plan. Um, you know, is, is really uh, engaging all the other city agencies to determine what is the count of all of their fleet vehicles? What type of vehicles do they have? Where do they park normally? Um, because we really need that information as soon as possible um, so that we can prepare uh, the extension of our, our trunk lines and so forth to uh, serve this load. Um, so so really uh, the, the engagement has been primarily through the uh, the mayor's task force, which actually is ongoing right now uh, for this month. Um, so that's where we, we normally go out and reach out to them uh, to request the information. But um, I think this is really going to help accelerate um, our ability to obtain that information. Terrific, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Hill, if you wouldn't mind taking your presentation off the screen, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm having uh, trouble seeing everyone. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, with that, um, Mr. Kikorian had to step out to attend a different, uh, he had to step out to attend a Metro committee, but he's gonna come back. Uh, so with that, we'll start uh, the questions. Uh, let's let's go with uh, Mr. Koretz and then Mr. De Leon. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is such an important issue and I really appreciate your leadership, Mr. Kikorian's uh, on it. Uh, EVs are likely to be at price parity within a few years with gasoline powered vehicles, and we need to be ready. And I have a couple serious concerns. One was pointed out to me by an incident in my district, which some people may be aware of. Um, we had a condo complex that was flooded um, and DWP, I think, was responsible and was going to pay for replacement vehicles. And they said, what an opportunity. Let's see if we can replace these with electric vehicles. Um, and they live in a very common building type in LA with five to 25 units, often dating back to mid-century last year with outdated infrastructure. And I'll skip the 10 minute explanation of all the terrible things that happened to them, but basically they found some impossible bureaucratic hurdles, which would exist for everyone in this circumstance um, and weren't able to, uh, to put in charging stations, chargers that, that would allow uh, them to have these electric vehicles. So I would just ask that uh, departments follow up with my office to get all the details and that we brainstorm ways to avoid them. One of the problems is that our, our system is set up and designed to create a disincentive for installer companies to work with very small multifamily building owners, which are the most common buildings in Los Angeles. And I think our numbers are skewed because over 95% of the rebate program participants qualify as level one and get the upgrade at no cost. But the number is skewed by the fact that many of them are corporate owners of new large apartment complexes. They're disproportionately represented. And the small building owners encounter all these bureaucratic snafus and end up never participating in our rebate program. So I'd like us to brainstorm how to get past these barriers and create a simple no cost process where owners of small multifamily residential buildings could be provided with a firm answer concerning upgrade costs at the beginning of the process, coupled with a list of approved installer companies that are willing to do the work because they found that uh, calling dozens of installer companies, virtually no one is willing to do the work because it's not as, uh, as lucrative. Um, so my, 
my question for staff is uh, how are we going to address these issues at scale around the city and make a real transformation possible? So, so I think, um, like you, you mentioned, um, engaging stakeholders. I mean, you know, starting with, with your your uh, office, we, we definitely need to hear about these um, these uh, situations and and just to really, uh, you know, hear about hear about the pains um, and and open it up to brainstorm um, with the, with everyone uh, on possible programs that can um, further provide, uh, let's say, incentives to get installers to support these, um, as well as ways that we can streamline the process. Um, so um, really, it's, it's going to start with uh, our engagement and then learning about these uh, pain points. Right. And just to just to summarize a couple of the other issues, the the cost beyond the subsidy was around $35,000. So the subsidy wasn't adequate in that circumstance. Plus they were told to bring electricity to the neighborhood to be able to install, I think it was 13 charging stations, mm -hmm. was going to cost them $200,000. So, so it just blew up yeah. every, any possibility yeah. of, of considering it. Yes, and, and you know we'll also need to bring in our partners in the industry of the manufacturers um, as they start to develop new technologies um, that, that might allow things such as like load management systems, um, allowing us to not require as significant of an upgrade um, at a at a lower cost point. So, so there's a lot of things we're going to have to look at, and a lot of people are going to uh, need to engage in, uh, with to to figure out solutions. Yes, well, thank you for focusing on that. Also, we expect the markets to grow. We know we have to make these transitions rapidly and we'll be competing with other cities, not only across the country, but across the world for the materials to produce uh, EV chargers, uh, transmission lines, power poles, solar panels. And in World War II, when FDR's team was planning for the production of Jeeps and planes and tanks, they found and cornered the market on metal and rubber they needed, needed in advance. So are we thinking and planning in this way? And can we figure out how to incentivize manufacturing of some of those items and provide jobs here locally? So that, that's something that, that we have to think about. Um, so right now we, we have not um, looked into uh, ways to to incentivize that uh, the manufacturing increasing it especially here so so that is something that we, we need to look into. Right, I could see if we don't plan it that we could find in a couple of years we're you know, happily moving along and suddenly we can't access many of the materials that we need. So a further question uh, is related. Do we expect to have the workforce available that we'll need to accomplish all this EV work and solar interconnection work? And will we have the engineers and construction workforce to do it? And if we'll need them in a few years, how can we get out in front of that? A very good question. Um, we don't know the answer, but we do know that we need to determine what the resource needs are. So that's part of this uh, master plan is to um, accelerate our ability to get this information um, to determine how many chargers are needed to um, not only serve our, 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 our um, residents, but then also our city agencies and their, and their fleets. Um, so, so the first step is to determine what, what is the scope? What do we need to be prepared for? And then, and then we're going to have to very, very quickly determine if we have the resources or if we can obtain the resources and the skill set needed to do this. And I'm hoping we can partner with our world-class local universities and colleges and even Hollywood, and also that we're focused on trying to pull people from uh, the declining fossil fuel industry um, and uh, use similar skills to pull them into uh, holding some of these positions as well. So that thought, and uh, also it seems like as we're waiting for all these electric vehicles to be manufactured, uh, it may take way too long and extracting the resources will 
use up our shrinking carbon budget. I understand there are companies that also do electric vehicle conversions from gas cars. So rather than, than accelerating our, our uh, shortages of materials, uh, that may also help us uh, achieve what we want. Uh, is there a way that we can incentivize those conversions in Los Angeles? Yeah, you, you know, um, as I mentioned, like this, uh, this whole uh, master plan it is, is never going to be finished. We're always going to be evaluating things such as the technologies. Um, and that is actually something very exciting to see um, being developed. Of course, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure it's a safe, uh, safe thing to, to support and sponsor. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely going to keep our eyes on, on the conversion um, industry and see um, what comes out of it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, quite exciting also, reducing the amount of materials required to produce uh, whole cars. So, And, and uh, we know there is technology. I mean, I remember Ed Bakley Jr. tooling around in his electric vehicle before we had electric vehicles because... He had one of those conversions. I mean, I don't think we've looked at the technology much since because we can buy electric vehicles. But now that we're looking at, at how do we engage in truly mass production, uh, conversion of older gasoline power vehicles will be crucial, I think, if we want to maintain the, the natural resources we need to change the whole city, change the whole world to uh, uh, non-polluting sources. Yeah, that's Thank it you. for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, before I bring Mr. DeLeon on, I just want to thank Mr. DeLeon, a state senator, for all the work he did to uh, increase, uh, in, uh, create funding uh, for our local municipalities. Uh, and as you just heard in, the, in Mr. Hill's amazing presentation, um, the city has taken full advantage of the incentives and rebates to get us to where we are today. Uh, and it's been a, it has been and will continue to be a great partnership in terms of making sure that we take full advantage of, of these incentives to help us electrify. So with that, Mr. Leon, thank you for your leadership at the State Senate. And uh, please go right ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate uh, your words uh, very much. And, um, and thank you for your leadership uh, here at the local level. I think it's uh, an example of both state and local working in concert with each other. And to the point I think you made originally, um, the city of LA in our region as a whole, the, the whole attainment district AQMD has made incredible strides uh, with more uh, telpipe uh, emitters, especially heavy duty diesel and drayage, uh, an increase in population. Um, however, to your point, we are still you know, the most polluted city in America uh, when it comes to ozone, when it comes to particular matter. So um, LA without question uh, will be, should be um, the, 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 the leader, uh, not just for the region, but for the entire state and the nation and quite frankly for the entire world. So our work is, is really cut out for us. And I thank you for uh, arranging for this presentation as before us. Uh, Jason, it's, it's a very good report. Um, it's uh, uh, comprehensive. So I, I thank you and, and all the staff that help put the, the PowerPoint deck uh, together for us to review. A couple things. One is, do you have um, the a list of all of the potential grants, both at the state and federal level, along with the application timelines, the deadlines? I think it's really important. I know um, I got a call uh, last week from uh, David Hochschild, the chair of the California Energy Commission, CEC. And I know that CEC is about to unleash from some past appropriations from the legislature, hundreds of millions of, of dollars um, at the same time. We don't know what the uh, what's going to happen ultimately with the uh, Build Back Better and the negotiations uh, in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, it seems to be just sort of kind of cratering more and more when it comes to our climate, you know, uh, 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 appropriations, uh, unfortunately. So at the end of the day, we don't know what that dollar figure is going to be and what's going to be left uh, uh, for uh, these types of projects. But that being said, can you provide us a list of all the grant programs, the state level, at the federal level, that may be a little more tricky with the pending dollars, with the negotiations right now in Washington, but with the application deadlines, uh, because it's important that we all have it. 
um, we want to make sure that we do not leave any money on the table. I think, I don't know, Mr. Corian is here or he may be at a Metro uh, meeting right now, but we've said this time and time again, uh, when we die on the sword and charge on the hill uh, to move heaven, heaven and earth to secure dollars, we want to make sure that at the local level where we are intended beneficiaries that we don't leave money on the table for other folks to take it uh, because we were too slow or we just couldn't get it done, uh, et cetera. Especially given the fact to Mr. O'Farrell's point that we are the most polluted city in America for ozone. Okay, yes, yes, uh, we can provide a list. Okay, uh, can you give me a ballpark figure as to when we can get that? Um, let's see, uh, can uh, we have uh, two weeks? Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so then, so then we're, we're so everyone's on the same page. So Mr. Koretz, uh, our chair, uh, Mr. Corin, myself, our our respective staff members, as well as everybody, we know what we're going for and how much we're going for. We know what the application deadlines are, which I think is is really really critical. But one thing I want to throw out there too is I think that we have to think big, you know, in a bold manner. And you know, I know our, our city fleet is 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 important without question, but also we have to think about Metro uh, as well as LA Unified School District uh, because it is the whole, you know, sort of, you know, region and not just exclusive to our, our city fleet. We can't think small ball or incrementalism, be incrementalist, but the bigger uh, uh, picture. I know that when uh, I, I wrote Proposition 39 uh, back in the day and when we got it passed overwhelmingly by the voters, um, as a result, uh, many school districts throughout the state received hundreds of millions of dollars for electrification, uh, the purchase, the procurement of uh, electric buses uh, for their kids in their respective school districts. One of the, um, not one of the, but the major challenge was, is many of these school districts, although with the procurement of the electric buses, didn't have the infrastructure that was laid out. And as a result, uh, we got a lot of electric buses with school districts with no infrastructure. And I think that is a challenge. And I think with LA Unified School District as a whole too, um, even uh, our very own Metro, any thoughts or comments? Yeah, um, absolutely right. And um, we have been in, engaged in discussions with LESD. In fact, we're also uh, talking to them about uh, MOU to support uh, both uh, electric bus um, infrastructure, but also um, charging stations for for staff. Um, so it's definitely on our radar, and we have um, been already evaluating certain sites specifically in support of I think some of the the grant funded bus purchases that you've mentioned. Um, however, I, I don't know if the locations have been locked down yet, so we're still working with them on that but we would like to uh, to have some kind of um you know mou to to provide them support uh, now uh you also mentioned the metro um we are also working with them and then one thing that that we do like is we see that they established a master plan for their electrification of all their buses by 2030 so um you know we're, we're encouraging uh, all the other agencies such such as uh, LAUSD to kind of look at uh, the master plan that LA Metro has established cuz um that is something that's it's going to really help um them but also help us in preparation for serving them so that we can ensure that the uh, larger infrastructure of our grid is going to pre be prepared um and and won't cause additional delays in the future um getting them the service very, very important, without question. And thank you for um, acknowledging the, the challenge uh, with LA Unified School District. Uh, obviously, um, they need the infrastructure, and, and working with them in collaboration and helping is. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have that, that, that. Well, they don't have that expertise. Uh, let's be just frank; they don't have that expertise. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, that expertise that was provided in a collaborative fashion. Uh, that can get them rolling because again, it's the entire region, you know, and not just our own uh, 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 clean uh, fleet of, of, of cars or soon to be a, a clean fleet of cars. Um, Mr. Mr. Corret said something uh, that I, I found very um, interesting um, and, and quite frankly, um, uh, highly accurate, uh, which is, um, I don't know if we've done a, a, 
small apartment buildings a, a, a great service uh, when it comes to access to this type of electrification uh, infrastructure. Uh, why don't you, um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, speak a little, expound on that and what the challenges are or why not, because uh, we've kind of left them out, you know, altogether. Yeah, it, you know, I think um, in there there may be some areas, uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, many areas where you've got neighborhoods uh, densely populated with multi-unit dwellings fed off of uh, one of our low voltage lower voltage circuits, like the 4.8 kV circuit, um, and those have limited capacity. And um, when you have a dense amount of vehicles that need to be charged, it's going to be a, a high amount of uh, power required. Um, with a, a more restrictive circuit in, in the neighborhood. So um, we are actually in our distribution um, planning and development side, we, we are exploring ways that we can do things such as like convert our distribution voltage to something higher that has higher capacity that could reduce the, the internet connection cost um, as, as we try to electrify, uh, especially in these more, more dense areas that have uh, more, more vehicles, more residents, um, with the traditionally or old infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Jason. And just maybe just uh, one point and just one inclusion slash, you know, commentary. Um, uh, going back uh, to we, when we talked about the school bus, especially LA Unified being the largest, you know, uh, school district you know, in, in the state, second in, in the nation, also is the opportunity for grid sharing uh, as well, mm -hmm. during the hottest months, um, as opposed to these buses sitting idle, you yeah. know, uh, during those hottest months, uh, we can be utilizing them for grid sharing, you know, which I think yep. is really critical. Yeah, thoughts it, on that? yeah actually, um, I, I didn't mention that, but um, that's also been part of the discussion. Like, uh, we've been talking to both the LUSD and their vendor um, about uh, the technology that they have to offer in terms of uh, vehicle to grid. So you know, we are interested in, in possibly uh, a pilot um, to, like you said, utilize um, some of that stored energy in electric buses during the uh, the hot months when the buses are not being used. So it's uh, it's definitely an opportunity, and we have got our eyes on it. We are in discussion uh, to to explore that. And lastly, I would say, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, for allowing me to indulge myself just for a moment. Um, in, in the larger sort of master plan, I think it's really critical that we uh, not just idolize, itemize, if you will, but you know, truly highlight the economic opportunities uh, in terms of, of job estimates so we can actually show and de demonstrate to uh, the electorate, to the public as a whole, you know, uh, that uh, what is possible uh, and what will happen in, in terms of economic growth and, and job creation. I think sometimes uh, we um, get caught up a lot, quite frankly, in clean electrons and, and electrification and the grid and the EVs and charging stations, you know, one, two, you know, rapid, you know, GHG, CO2, CO2, COVID, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the one thing that I, I sort of attempted to do uh, in the beginning with Senate Bill 350, they took us to 50% RPS, 50% energy efficiency, you know, statewide, uh, the precursor to SB 100 was sort of kind of reframed and changed the narrative in terms of economic growth and jobs that are real and tangible uh, that provide the economic growth for everyday uh, Californians, everyday Angelinos. I know that, you know, for the purpose of, of this meeting, uh, everyone can geek out a lot, you know, uh, with all the acronyms and so forth, you know, but having, you know, uh, a, a clear, you know, narrative that's definitive with some data points that drives the narrative in terms of jobs, you know, the definition of those jobs and that creation. You know, I know we talk about just transition and so forth. We just don't do it enough. And I think that uh, folks in the climate sort of intelligentsia sphere, if you will, sometimes don't do themselves a service um, because not everyone reads the Atlantic Magazine or the New York or New York Times. Uh, we got to get to everyday folks, you know, in terms of the profound economic policies and the impacts that it has, not just public health wise, but also to jobs, Sim, plain and simple, jobs, jobs, jobs. So um, I would really highly, you know, recommend that we have a definition of jobs and the projection of the types of jobs, again, and the number of jobs that will be created as a result 
of our new transformational policies uh, dealing with issue of climate and obviously the air that we breathe into our lungs. It sounds good. Yes, yes, we will really include that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon, and thank you, Mr. Koretz, for your questions. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hill, uh, LADWP, thank you for your terrific presentation, your thoughtful responses to our questions. Uh, and we, we know clearly there's so much more work to be done, but um, we're off to a great start. And so you know, what I'd like to do is uh, we'll continue the item uh, and, and return by December, but with some uh, instructions. Uh, so what I'd like to do is that, uh, what I'd like to uh, advise and instruct is that in the next couple of months, the DWP uh, work in collaboration with all city agencies as needed. We're gonna add a few of those to produce an initial report that outlines the forecasts on power needs and projected infrastructure placement uh, related to L2 and L3 placement uh, specifically. Uh, to reach that goal, I'd like all the departments in the following two months through my office to work with the LADWP to create the foundation of the final instruction on this newly refocused master plan process. However, at the next hearing, I'd specifically like to hear from the following departments on this topic, Bureau of Engineering, General Services Department, Los Angeles Department of Transportation, Bureau of Street Lighting, the Port of Los Angeles, and Los Angeles World Airports. Uh, many of, of uh, these agencies are already involved, but there are a few new ones throwing, thrown in today. Uh, I, I'd like all necessary departments, especially those mentioned, uh, to work with my office and LEDWP in the next couple of months to place the pieces together for uh, committee action including but not limited to identifying and mapping out all vehicle fleet needs, all city vehicle. Mike Tess, ITA, can you hear me? Worst case scenario, sir. Mr. DeLeon, are those electric? <laughs> it is electric. Uh, it's uh, actually human powered by my right hand. That there you go. I know. It's the one that uh, uh, went JPL, uh, Mars. Awesome. Yeah. Carbon neutral. Carbon <laughs> neutral. There you go. Mr. Chair, I think we're good to go. We're good to go now. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, members of the public, thank you for your patience. We held the meeting uh, the moment we found out that uh, we're having technical difficulties disabling your ability to hear the meeting. Um, uh, our, uh, our CLA, Mr. Sutton Willis, read uh, item uh, number two. Uh, and uh, so we are ready to get on with it. Colleagues, uh, this is $30 million allocated in our current fiscal year budget, uh, which Mr. Krikorian uh, worked with through his committee. And, and uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, to have this historic and monumental investment in our municipal solar and storage program. Uh, to address the climate emergency crises facing our city, we are fighting literally on every front, approving 100% renewables, zero carbon, phasing out oil drilling, reducing plastics. Um, the item we just discussed regarding our EV master plan and now our solar and storage program. This is an unprecedented coordinated investment between the Department of Water and Power and many of our city agencies to literally transform the city of Los Angeles, moving us one step closer toward achieving our goal of 100% clean energy by 20, 
35. This is very reachable, uh, but it's going to take fire on all cylinders every step of the way in order to reach this goal. It's not just hyperbole. We intend on making sure it happens. I also want to thank uh, my co-presenter of this motion, as I mentioned, Mr. Krikorian, of course, consistent work to improve our shared environment for future generations. And of course, Mr. DeLeon and Mr. Koretz, you're both environmental leaders. Goes without saying, uh, we present a very strong front here. I understand that we have, uh, I see Deborah Weintraub from your engineering uh, to give us a quick update. We also have representatives from the Department of General Services and the Department of Water and Power to present uh, or answer any questions. And then during the presentation, I'd like the departments to describe our city policies that govern sustainability and how the city could ensure that all future city projects reduce reliance on the power grid or feedback power into it. Uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Weintraub, if you could please go over uh, your presentation as the project manager. Thank you, Council Member O'Farrell and committee members. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here today. In preparation for today's meeting, we've been in dialogue with members, with staff from all of your offices and also staff from the CAO, the CLA, General Services Department and DWP. We've basically been discussing building decarbonization strategies for the city's existing buildings and facilities better understanding the investments that DWP is able to make for renewable generation within the LA Basin and discussing how best to use general fund dollars to advance the city's decarbonization efforts. This motion and several other council motions direct city departments to prioritize building decarbonization and related efforts that include photovoltaic installations, EV charging that we just heard about, um, electric grid renewable energy generation and identify funding to address decarbonization. So in terms of our past um, efforts, the city of Los Angeles and the Bureau of Engineering have been leaders in the implementation of green building practices since 2002 when council adopted the lead rating system for buildings over 7,500 square feet. We have quite a large portfolio of it is distinctive, makes the city stand out of LEED certified building. In addition, the Bureau of Engineering has currently pursuing net zero energy projects uh, as pilot projects for some of our new construction. We've also done some uh, fairly significant photovoltaic um, installations, the largest being the rooftop installation at the convention center, which covers three acres of roof surface generates 2.21 megawatts of power, offsets approximately 15% of the convention center's electric needs, and was completed in March of 2018. This was a feed and tariff installation. And then there are a number of other photovoltaic installations that we've led. So in talking with our colleagues, particularly at General Services, uh, Melody McCormick who's here, there are approximately 600 existing city buildings each of them unique in age, size, location, maintenance history, solar access, the level of electrification and resiliency. Um, on the one hand, we have highly efficient uh, buildings that are lead platinum. And the other hand, we have 40 year old facilities with poor building envelopes and inefficient systems. We know there are a number of database sources that we can look at to try and create a prioritized list for decarbonization of these facilities. And these include G GSD's asset management system, their energy cap software, Department of Building Safety's existing building uh, energy use reporting and BOE's tracking of lead projects. Um, we recommend, we're here to talk collectively with you about an integrated and augmented prioritization list for decarbonization, which we hope will create a multi-year work plan that we're calling a building decarbonization work plan. Um, and we hope this will be a roadmap to meet your goal of net zero carbon for all existing city facilities by 2050 and identify the near term projects that can be implemented most quickly. Um, so with that, we recommend this collaborative effort proceed this work building decarbonization work plan be created. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Council Member. Thank you, Ms. Weintraub, very much. And uh, great points. Um, I have uh, 
a fairly robust um, list of recommendations I'll be making. My questions, just a few questions I have are for GSD and LADWP. Uh, so uh, here goes uh, to uh, GSD. Um, to what degree does the Department of General Services currently perform building energy analysis of city facilities? Uh, and, Melody McCormick yes. with the Department of General Services. Um, uh, very little, unfortunately, and that's why we're so excited to be part of this project. Um, as you know, our building maintenance division is primarily composed of trades, electricians, roofers, so forth. Um, we do have um, a third-party software system called Energy Cap, and it's where we pay our utility bills through. It has the ability to um, pull reporting from it um, to help us evaluate our utility costs. Um, and um, unfortunately, when our EWM, our energy water management program was defunded last year, um, the person managing that retired. We're trying to reboot that this year. Um, and we think that energy water management group is the perfect place to cite this new solar initiative. And we're hoping that um, the data that we have in energy cap, as well as our, city, um, our city's asset management system, where we keep track of all of our portfolio um, assets, as well as all of our building maintenance um, work orders, our collective, it's about 55,000 work orders a year. We hope that all of those data points um, will help us work with BOE on, um, and you know, a consultant to develop um, a prioritized plan um, as which facilities are best suited um, for resiliency generation systems and grid connection systems and net energy meter systems. Um, and so we've been working with DWP on the MOU. Um, I know that we, um, you know, we've talked collectively about starting off with three to 10 projects, um, RGS or GCS within the next year, and then also looking at um, which ones would be best suited for, um, for NAM projects. Uh, and so we're hoping to have some assistance um, from a consultant who's experienced in solar analytics to help us develop that plan that Deborah just referred to. Um, because right now we're looking at a 600 facility portfolio and trying to understand what are the best practices in the industry and where we should start. Thank you, Melody. Uh, very excited uh, to have GSD leaning in on this. <laughs> Um, I have a few quick questions for Arash from the Department of Water and Power. Um, Arash, what does the DWP consider to be a priority for the city? A net metered system or a grid resilient system? Of course, it doesn't have to be either or, but in your experience, what has traditionally been the priority? Um, it's a great question you bring up. Um, Thank you, folks. Uh, so, so basically, it's it's a combination of both. Each site is going to be a different uh, situation. So, in some uh, situations, you have a facility that's a twenty four seven operation. It's a, it's a critical facility. It, for instance, is a nine one one operating center. That would be an example of where you would want to make sure you have resiliency um, available to to serve the on site needs. Um, ideally, in every perfect instance, we would like to deploy net metered so that way we can actually reduce uh, on-site consumption and achieve the, the mandates that have been set whether at the executive directive level or um, uh, coming from council but ultimately it's it's a combination of both we want to see as much behind the meter and in front of the meter installations to essentially address any possible scenario um, that presents itself that's phenomenal i mean you just made a grand statement and that is every single building perhaps off the grid. And of course that ultimately is the goal and that would be a quantum leap forward. So, so thank you. Uh, 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 my other question, are there grants or federal dollars available to assist the city in planning for this effort that you're aware of? That's something that we're currently examining. Uh, we've been having meetings at the federal level, whether, whether it's with the Department of Energy and other folks who um, could potentially unlock funds that we could somehow funnel in towards projects that um, serve these specific purposes, resiliency purposes. Um, at the state level, there's, there is funding for uh, potentially energy storage, 
as well as um, EV chargers. So as we look at public facing facilities, we wanna make sure all those facilities have the full gamut of solar storage and EV installed. Ideally, we can install fast chargers. That way we can provide quick charging and have folks um, pop in and out of those facilities. Um, and then at the, at the local level, you know, we, we do have our utility budget, which allows us to install these front of the meter systems that is uh, partially funded through AB 32 and other um, funding mechanisms that have been unlocked as a result of um, past legislation. Terrific. Thank you. Now, Mr. Koretz has his hand up, but I don't see Mr. Koretz. Oh, there he is. In fact, Mr. Koretz never had his hand down. So uh, I'll call upon you first, sir. Uh, you're on mute. And I said such brilliant things while I was on mute, but uh, I'll try again. So I'm, I'm curious if the city and DWP jointly and our city facilities, including all the proprietaries, could qualify as, as a unit for the feed and tariff program and generate some income for the city to help cover some of the costs of the solar and storage program? The simple answer is yes, they can, they can absolutely qualify. We actually do have an example of a feed and tariff project that's hosted on a city property. I believe it's a rec and park facility. Um, and that's something that we should absolutely put on the, on the drawing board as we're evaluating these 600 plus uh, sites that um, Ms. Weintraub brought up earlier. Uh, in, in addition to that, there, there is a value to also having city-owned um, facilities because there is an option there where we can install energy storage and not pass off that cost to, um, the, to, the, to the property owners or what have you. Uh, at, ultimately, we're trying to maintain the most reliable grid, and that's basically making sure that we have energy storage um, scattered throughout the city, especially in zones that we've indicated as um, areas that we want to focus more attention on. Yeah, so I was just thinking if we could do this in a much more substantial way, uh, it, it seems like there could be you know, pretty serious cost savings and monies available to us. So just would encourage that as, as a thought. It's, it's a great point. And, you know, in, in uh, I think about a year and a half ago, uh, your honorable council actually have approved that 300 megawatt runway that essentially allows us to to offer these fit agreements. So we're going to make that a priority um, as part of the discussions to be had in evaluating those 600 plus sites. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Thank you again for your leadership on this issue too, Mr. Chairman. I just, a couple of really quick points. Um, number one, uh, we have a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance uh, in all of our city facilities. Uh, this year, we set aside $75 million for uh, park investments in projects that have been deferred and 20, another $20 million in shuttered child care centers and across all departments, there's a lot of deferred maintenance. And I, I think this is implied in what we included in the motion, but I would just like to make sure that as we're prioritizing projects, one of the considerations that we use to prioritize is where can our investments in solar and other energy improvements leverage our ability to make up some of that deferred maintenance as well. You know, you got a, an old roof, perfect opportunity to put in the new roof when we put in the, the, the new solar, th those sorts of things. Now, I know you always think that way and uh, GSD and BOE both are always thinking that way, but I just really wanted to emphasize, this is a rare opportunity to inject new money in ways that as Mr. Kretz well pointed out, will have ongoing general fund savings for departments. At the same time, we want to make sure we maximize the efficiency of that investment in improving the, the condition of the physical plant as well. So that, I just want to make that point. I know it probably goes without saying. Second point is um, there's a sense of urgency in spending this money. Um, we, we took some big leaps in this budget 
to try to uh, spend large amounts of money uh, that, at least in part, is intended to spur uh, the local economy as well and to, to you know, get that money spent. And um, so I think it's really important that we uh, identify as quickly as we can where uh, our departments in, in fulfilling this project, where our departments will need um, help with new positions, new funding, also where it's more efficient to use um, consultants in order to address the prioritization process immediately. So as quickly as we can, I'd like to turn around your best thinking on that so that we can either get positions approved, uh, get uh, consultants on, on board so that by the end of the fiscal year, we're, we're really moving towards, towards spending this money. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Uh, any uh, other comments or uh, ideas, uh, Arash or Melody? All right. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just amend the item with the, the following uh, instructions. Uh, so bear with me. It's a lot. Um, but I'd like to amend instruction uh, two uh, to read, I further move that the BOE working closely with GSD, LADWP, the CAO, the CLA, uh, uh, RAP, uh, and other city departments to create a building decarbonization work plan assessing the renewable solar energy generation potential of existing municipal buildings in order to prioritize projects for net energy metered systems, resiliency generation systems, or grid connected systems. The work plan should identify up to 25 facilities that are strong candidates for near-term pilot distributed energy generation systems that offer a high degree of solar energy generation efficiency, high community value and project shovel readiness, giving special priority to buildings in disadvantaged communities in Los Angeles. The work plan should leverage the existing GSD asset database, existing energy audits and physical needs assessments, existing energy use data and pursue more comprehensive projects where feasible. The work plan should address opportunities for cost efficiency and time efficiency through strategies such as bundling of projects and should include a funding plan for expeditiously spending the fiscal year 21-22 funds. Uh, Bureau of Engineering, with the assistance of the other city departments, should report back in 90 days on progress towards this goal. I'd like to also add the following new instructions that the CAO and CLA review the city's financial policies, section two, capital and technological improvements, and report back to council with a recommendation in order to update city resiliency and sustainability policies, such that future facility building power reliant projects support the goals of LA's Green New Deal toward reaching a 100% clean energy grid and instruct the CAO and CLA to report back on options to include such solar battery resiliency projects in city long-term capital and technological improvement plans. Instruct the controller to transfer $500,000 from the unappropriated balance to a new account in the Engineering Special Services Fund, number 682, department number 50, entitled Building Decarbonization Work Plan for city staff and consultant costs so that the Bureau of Engineering can develop a building decarbonization work plan. This work plan will consider the building users, building area, the year built, the maintenance history, energy use intensity, solar access, electric grid conditions, council priorities, and other criteria. Uh, further instruct the, the uh, council provide six months salary funding totaling $63,700 at the Bureau of Engineering for an Electrical Engineering Associate three account 1010 Salaries General. 
Additionally, instruct the city council to add position authority and six months funding from the unappropriated balance at the Department of General Services, account 1010, for one building construction maintenance superintendent, one electrical supervisor, and one electrician, totaling $187,500. I further move that the city council add from the unappropriated balance $75,000 for maintenance materials and supplies into account 3160. $37,500 for administrative and training expenses into account 6010, dollars and $50,000 for zero emissions transportation equipment into account 7340. Further, authorize the city engineer, general services department, or designee to make any technical and accounting corrections to the recommendations above necessary to effectuate the intent of the city council action and further instruct that once the first set of reports are completed, the CAO, CLA, BOE, and DWP report back quarterly with recommendations and updates on the program. Uh, that's all I have, colleagues. Um, Mr. Koretz, yes, you have something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to be sure that an examination of feed and tariff projects for our facilities is clearly included as part of that direction. That's fine. Yes, thank you. Uh, we can add as well the feed and tariff program as part of uh, these evaluations and this, uh, this instruction. Uh, all right, with that, I again want to thank my team, the dynamic duo of David Heron and Stark Barsamian on all the work, and it was weekly, daily, uh, uh, lots of work product went into just getting to this moment. So, so thank you to my team for that. Uh, and now without further ado, uh, we can approve this item as amended. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, please call the roll. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Koretz. Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved as amended, sir. Thank you so much. In addition to thanking my team, I also want to thank all of the environmental advocates who worked closely with my team and work with all of yours as well uh, so that we you know, collectively move forward uh, with this imperative. Uh, and with that, Mr. Villanueva, do we have anything else before this committee today? The desk is clear, sir. All right, well, thank you all. Very good meeting. We're getting things done. Really appreciate the work of everyone on this panel and all of your staffs. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.